Um, we are thrilled to have our own Dr. Nicole Bouvier here with us today for her grand rounds on influenza, current concepts, and future directions. Dr. Bouvier received her medical degree with distinction in research here at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine and stayed for her internal medicine residency training here. Dr. Bouvier served as a postdoctoral fellow in the Physician Scientist Research Training Program in the Pathogenesis of Viral Diseases in the Laboratory of doc Dr. Peter Polisi here at Mount Sinai, where she began to study the transmission of a saltimavir resistant influenza A virus. She completed her infectious disease fellowship here and is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Microbiology, Infectious Diseases, and the Department of Medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bouvier. Now I'm going to silence my phone. Okay. Um, so thanks for the invitation to come talk to you about my favorite virus. Um, and actually the timing was perfect because it's flu season. Um, this is data from New York State, hot off the press from Friday. And as you can see, the number of flu reports is sort of going into an exponential growth curve um, in pretty much all parts of the state. And even though you know, this little blip here is a drop in the bucket of what we'll be expecting this winter. Once the line starts lifting up off the baseline, we're pretty much ready to launch into flu season. So it's here. So the objectives of my talk are to talk about mainly the evidence base for influenza management. We're going to talk briefly about clinical features, but mainly focus on diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some future directions um, things that are coming down the pipeline uh, soon for influenza treatment. Um, I have no conflicts. I will, however, be discussing uses of the neuraminidase inhibitor class of drugs that are not FDA approved but are supported by evidence-based medicine and professional society guidelines. Okay, clinical features. So when we think about flu, we tend to think about uncomplicated influenza, and what really separates flu from other upper respiratory tract infections are the systemic symptoms. So these are the things like fever, chills, headache, body aches, just feeling like you got hit by a truck. And this is usually very abrupt on onset. Typically, somebody will come in and say, you know, I woke up and I felt fine, and by that night, I was in bed with a fever of 103. Luckily, this is the what makes you feel worse, but it's what is the shortest. So the respiratory symptoms are really indistinguishable from other upper respiratory tract infections um, and last longer than the systemic symptoms. And as a little pearl, people actually don't sneeze that much with the flu. That tends to be more of a feature of the common cold. Um, people with flu tend to cough a little bit more than sneeze. And these symptoms can last up to a week. And most people usually feel back to themselves within one to two weeks of the onset of symptoms. So if that's uncomplicated influenza, what is complicated influenza? And that's basically pulmonary and non-pulmonary complications. So the, the first complication is a primary viral pneumonia, and that's essentially a viral pneumonia. It's a monophasic illness, which starts like a typical uncomplicated flu, but instead of starting to feel better after a few days, the person actually gets worse and starts developing signs and symptoms of lower respiratory tract involvement. The chest x-ray of primary viral pneumonia looks like this, diffuse bilateral or multi-lobar opacities. And it is the most rare complication, especially with seasonal flu. It's a little bit more uh, common with pandemic flu, but it is the most severe pulmonary complication. What's much more common is secondary bacterial pneumonia. And this is a bacterial pneumonia following what seemed to be an uncomplicated flu illness. So this is a biphasic illness, so a person will have typical regular flu and they'll start feeling better and then about a week later you know anywhere from four to 14 days later they'll start developing signs and symptoms of bacterial pneumonia and basically it is bacterial pneumonia so you'll see a, a focal or low bar con consolidation and the pathogens are overwhelmingly strep pneumonia and staph aureus um, to a lesser extent, Haemophilus. And we don't really fully understand what makes people sus more susceptible to these pathogens immediately following influenza infection, but it is quite common, and it's the most common complication in adults and particularly older adults. Now, in children, most children who end up in the hospital with flu have no particular risk factor that's identifiable, but for those who do have an identifiable risk factor, it tends to be asthma. And then for adults, it's people with COPD. 
Um, and it actually, for our people with, with patients with COPD, it can result in a permanent decrement of pulmonary function. So you actually don't get back to your respiratory baseline after flu. And the uh, American College of Chest Physicians actually makes a grade 1B recommendation for flu vaccination in this patient cohort. So what are non-pulmonary complications? There are some rare musculoskeletal complications like myositis, rarely myopericarditis. But I did want to mention myocardial infarction. So there is epidemiological and other data suggesting that uh, flu season is also MI season. So this is epidemiological data from England and Wales here on the left, Hong Kong on the right. The blue line is ILL consultations to general practitioners on the Hong Kong graph. It's the number of specimens that are positive for flu. And the orange line is the number of MIs. And you can sort of see that as flu peaks every year, so do MIs. And just so you can see that this is not just a, you know, that flu is not a surrogate marker for something else like cold weather or something else that happens in the winter, Hong Kong actually has two annual epidemics. They have one in the winter and one in the summer. So you can see this blue line has these two little peaks here. And the MI curve also has two peaks that follow these seasonal peaks of flu. So although you know, it's not causal, these data suggest that anyone with pre-existing cardiac disease who gets influenza on top of it is at higher risk of death than somebody who doesn't have pre-existing cardiac disease. And there actually is AHA ACC class 1B recommendation for patients to get annual flu vaccination if you have coronary artery disease. So there are other rarer complications. We tend to think of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, these occur both after infection and vaccination, so they're probably antibody mediated. And it's important to remember that there are obstetric complications as well, which make uh, pregnant women a class that we try to vaccinate. So who is at risk for complicated flu? Basically the kind of patients that we see here. People with chronic cardiovascular, pulmonary, renal, and metabolic disease, people with primary and secondary immunodeficiencies, anyone who has neurological disease that compromises the management of secretions, and then obesity, and in particular morbid obesity, is a risk factor that sort of came to light during the 2009 pandemic, and we've been seeing it ever since, that people who have a BMI over 40 are far, far more likely to die of complications of flu than people who are a normal weight. And then of course pregnancy, not only for the mother, particularly in the third trimester and immediately postpartum, there's also risks to the fetus as well. And it's important to remember that older people actually don't get the flu that much, the attack rates are much higher in children. And that's probably because most older people have been exposed repeatedly to flu throughout their lives and have some degree of heterosubtypic immunity. But certainly for those of older adults who do get the flu, mortality is highest. All right, so let's move on to diagnosis. What about rapid flu tests? Now, we don't use these as much as we used to since we went to PCR-based testing here at Mount Sinai, but these are two meta-analyses, one from Annals uh, a few years ago, the other one is from CID earlier this year. And basically, these are meta-analyses of multiple manufacturers' rapid tests. So there are, I don't know, probably 10, 15 different manufacturers of rapid tests. So these meta-analyze all of these. And so each one has over 100 studies. In the earlier study, it was about half PCR-based uh, confirmation. The other half was either culture-based or a combination of PCR and culture. And the more recent meta-analysis is basically all PCR confirmed. And I think that reflects the fact that in the intervening years, we've pretty much moved to PCR as being the gold standard for the, the diagnosis of flu. But that, you know, despite the fact that they're looking at sort of a non-overlapping group of studies, they both came up with fairly similar data showing that the rapid flu test has a very high specificity. So if it's positive, you can believe it. But it actually has pretty low sensitivity, only about 60%. And I think that's probably surprisingly low for most of us because we tend to think of tests that we use as being better than that. Um, as an example, for instance, rapid st strep tests are probably 85 to 90 percent sensitive. Rapid HIV tests are closer to 100 percent sensitive. The rapid flu test is pretty bad. Um, and so really, a negative rapid flu test cannot rule out influenza. And again, we don't see this as much as we used to, 
because um, now we have PCR-based testing. But we used to admit patients all the time from the ER who had had a rapid test that was negative, who turned out to have flu anyway. So if somebody comes in from the community, from like a you know, city MD, urgent care facility or something, and they say, you know, I had a negative rapid flu test, doesn't matter, just PCR test anyway. So if rapid testing is not great, what about just clinical acumen? So these are a couple studies that were conducted during flu season looking for predictors of influenza. So what are the clinical signs and symptoms that predict that someone will test positive for flu? And if you take patients who came in with a cough, and I've outlined those curves in these blue dots, as fever gets higher, the probability that they will test PCR positive for flu increases. So that somebody who has a fever of 38 has about a 70 or 80% chance of having flu if they also have a cough and it's flu season. When the temperature goes up to 40, it's more like 90 to 100% certain that they have flu. So for ambulatory outpatients, people who are otherwise healthy and are out in the community, when flu is circulating in the community, like it is now, the the combination of fever and cough has a sensitivity of approaching 80% for the diagnosis of flu. Now, obviously, the specificity is quite low because there are lots of other viruses that cause influenza-like illness. But the sensitivity really compares favorably, and one could even argue is better than a rapid flu test. So when somebody shows up in your office in IMA, and they have a fever and a cough, and it's flu season, you're not gonna get much more from doing a rapid flu test than your own clinical acumen has already told you because the sensitivity is not high enough to change your pretest probability in this kind of patient. But it is important to remember that in some patients, particularly elderly patients or people who are immunosuppressed, flu can present with sort of proteus, protean symptoms. So, Older people especially can present without typical respiratory symptoms and can have more systemic or um, nonspecific symptoms like just being off their baseline. So this time of year when you're seeing an elderly person who just isn't themselves, along with all the other things you think of like UTI, pneumonia, med side effects, this time of year you have to put influenza on your differential as well because they may not be coughing and sniffling like you would expect them to be. And in this scenario, rapid flu testing actually may help if you have a low pretest probability, like it's summertime or the patient doesn't look like they have the flu, then a positive test actually can affect your pretest probability quite a bit and increase it um, to a, a greater post test probability. So what about hospitalized patients? So this was a study that was done in a large hospital in Ottawa, and it was during the 2009 pandemic. So it was flu season. Um, what they did is they screened uh, consecutive admissions, whether they were being admitted for a respiratory diagnosis or otherwise, with this algorithm. The presence of cough or shortness of breath plus a fever equaled influenza, and that bought you respiratory isolation. So it's the similar algorithm to the one that we were just talking about for outpatients. So how did it perform? Not particularly well. So the sensitivity was about 75%, which is in line with what we've seen for you know, otherwise healthy ambulatory outpatients, but the spe specificity was really low. And so they point out that this screening tool missed 26% of active influenza cases, while 67% of non-influenza patients were unnecessarily placed in respiratory isolation. So in a hospitalized cohort where there are other factors at play, like do I need to put this patient in isolation? Do I need to be treating them with neuraminidase inhibitors? This algorithm probably is not sensitive or specific enough. And in that case, we use PCR-based testing. And what this does is it detects the genome of the virus. It doesn't tell you whether it's viable or not. It just tells you that the genome is there. At Mount Sinai, we have a particular manufacturer's test that detects influenza A, influenza B, and RSV all in one. So whether you want RSV or, or the other flu, you, you get it. And basically, it's pretty simple. You just put the sample into this little cartridge, close it up, plug it into the machine, and an hour later, it tells you if you've got flu or RSV. And this is highly sensitive and specific. So this is the test of choice for patients who are hospitalized or patients for whom a positive diagnosis would change your management. 
So let's talk quickly about treatment. So there are two classes of influenza drugs that are approved for use in the United States. The first class acts at a step pretty early in the viral life cycle. These are the adamantanes or the M2 blockers, amantadine and rimantadine. So the way that flu gets into cells is by having its receptor binding protein, which is called hemagglutinin, engages with a receptor and is taken up by receptor mediated endocytosis. And so then you have your virus particle inside of an endosome. Now it needs to get its genome out of the virus particle and into the cytoplasm and then eventually into the nucleus so that it can replicate its genome, translate its proteins and assemble into more viruses. And so when it's in this state, it's got sort of two lipid bilayers in between it and where it wants to be. So what the, the virus does is also the hemagglutinin protein, which is a membrane-bound protein in the viral envelope, undergoes this sort of complicated conformational change where it sort of unfolds like a jackknife, and it's, it reaches out and grabs the endosomal membrane and pulls it down towards the viral envelope, and eventually the two bilayers merge, and you end up being able to get the contents of the virus out into the cytoplasm where you want them to be. And this hemagglutin confirm conformational change is triggered by low pH. So endosomes are a very low pH environment. What M2 does is it's actually an ion channel and it allows the protons from the endosome to sort of flux through the uh, membrane of the virus th through the viral envelope and acidify the hemagglutinin that allows it to do this unfolding and fusion activity. And the adamantanes or the M2 blockers block this process from happening. The other class is the neuraminidase inhibitors, oseltamivir, zanamivir, and paramivir. And they work at the very last step of viral rep replication, which is release. So virus is, new virus particles are assembled at the plasma membrane of the infected cell. And ideally, what they want to do is they want to go off and be free to infect another cell or another person. But there's a problem. So there's hemagglutin in here the receptor binding protein on the progeny virus. And there's also flu receptors being expressed on the surface of the cell that it's trying to get away from. So this hemagglutinin is gonna to stick to this receptor unless something tells it not to. And what that something is, is an enzyme called neuraminidase. So what neuraminidase does is it essentially cleaves this receptor, it destroys it so that the hemagglutinin on the progeny virus can't stick to the cell that it's trying to butt out of and it allows it to go fr be free. And by inhibiting the neuraminidase, that prevents the, the enzyme from destroying these receptors and you get the progeny virus sort of stuck to the cell that they're trying to get out of. So it doesn't prevent virus from being made. What it does is it makes the next cycle of replication going on to infect another cell or another person less efficient. Um, and so that's what the neuraminidase inhibitors do. So, Ideally, what you would want is an antiviral drug that prevents virus from ever being made. You know, neuraminidase inhibitors are nice, but you still get virus, and eventually they'll break free and infect another cell. But unfortunately, pretty much all human viruses are resistant to the adamantine class, which is why we never use amantadine. So for all intents and purposes, all we have are neuraminidase inhibitors, even though they're probably suboptimal drugs in terms of how we would like um, an antiviral drug to be. So neuraminidase inhibitors are essentially receptor analogs. So in order to destroy the receptor, the neuraminidase enzyme has to bind it. And so what the neuraminidase inhibitors do is they sort of are small molecule mimics of this receptor and they sort of tuck into the active site of the neuraminase enzyme and prevent it from binding sialic acid, which is the receptor, its normal substrate. So the oldest drug, the one we have most experience with is oseltamivir, it's oral. It's really a well-tolerated drug. Um, GI side effects are common. And I want to mention there are reports of neurological toxicities related to oseltamivir. These are mostly post-marketing reports primarily from Japan and primarily in young adults and adolescents with encephalopathies ranging from just dizziness all the way to suicidal ideation. And because these are post-marketing reports, there's unclear causality, but there is, has been at least enough evidence in Japan that in Japan, 
Also, Tamiva actually has a black box warning for young adults and adolescents and is no longer used in that age group unless their life is at, at stake. Um, it's not something that I'm familiar with and I've ever seen happen, but just to let you know that this is potentially an issue. The other drug is Zanamivir. And it's actually an inhaled drug, and that's because it has bad oral bioavailability. So oseltamivir is actually formulated as a pro-drug that gets metabolized in your liver into the active drug. Zanamivir, they don't have that, they didn't make it that way. So what you do is you basically just inhale the drug straight into your respiratory tract, which is where it's working anyway. So it comes in this inhaler doohickey where you have these little blisters of dry powder that you put in the inhaler and you crush the, the little blister and you inhale it. And I think the reason we don't use it very often is because most people would like to take a pill rather than try to figure out how to use an inhaler. And for people who know how to use inhalers like asthmatics or people with COPD, this drug is contraindicated because the way it's formulated is it's mixed up in, in a lactose-based powder to keep it um, in particle form and the lactose can theoretically exacerbate reactive airway disease. So it's actually contraindicated in the group that is most familiar with using inhaled drugs. And there is actually IV formulation that's in clinical trials right now. The IV drug that we have available is Paramavir. Um, it is intravenous. Interestingly enough, it is only FDA approved for use in outpatients, so otherwise uncomplicated influenza. Why you would use an IV drug in an outpatient is something we will discuss in a moment. Um, it is not FDA approved for hospitalized patients, but we probably you will use it that way, and that this is the dose if you do. It also has GI side effects. These are side effects from the clinical trials. Mainly what we've been seeing is mostly GI side effects, and otherwise, like oseltamivir and zanamivir, is otherwise well tolerated. So you've probably heard that you're supposed to start neuraminidase inhibitors for flu within 48 hours. Does everybody sort of know that golden rule? Why do you think that is? Basically, it's because that's how the drug companies design their trials. And what you present to the FDA is what they will give you for an indication. And so the vast majority of clinical trials for oseltamivir and zanamivir were done in otherwise healthy outpatients. And what the drug companies knew is that you'd have to start the drug fairly early in order to have any effect, because flu doesn't last that long anyway. Flu sort of, it's, it, does, it doesn't want to hang around in you for a long time. What it does is it gets in, it replicates as fast as it can, and it goes on to infect the next person before your immune system can stop it. So it gets in and gets out. And the, the replication cycle of flu in any given person, you know, you might be shedding virus for five days, six days. You actually aren't shedding virus for a really long time. The virus is not trying to stay in you for a long time. It's just trying to get in, reproduce as quickly as it can, and go on and infect another person. So because it's such an acute self-limited illness, if you're giving an antiviral, you have to give it early or your immune system is gonna already be taking care of the problem before the drug even gets there. So this is an example of one of the trials that was uh, presented to the FDA for approval of, of oseltamivir, and it's a very typical trial. Um, healthy adults, non-elderly, with influenza-like illness of, in this case, less than 36 hours. And what you can see is the median time to alleviation of symptoms for the placebo group was about four and a quarter days. There were two different oseltamivir doses, but basically both of them sort of uh, had a median time to improvement of three days. So a short but significant improvement in time to uh, feeling better. But the important thing to realize is that this is only the influenza infected patients. If you sort of are thinking about all comers, a lot of the people that you might give, an, uh, give a neuraminase inhibitor to probably don't even have flu. When somebody shows up in your office with an influenza-like illness, and you don't trust a rapid flu test, and the PCR is gonna take a few hours to come back, and you have to decide, am I gonna treat this person or not? And if you do decide to treat them, chances are a good proportion of those people aren't actually gonna have influenza. They're gonna have some other virus. And in fact, in this trial, only 60% of the people that they enrolled actually had flu. The other 40% had something else entirely, and we wouldn't expect oseltamivir to work on something else entirely. So the effectiveness, the real world 
effectiveness of these drugs is actually lower than it is if you only look at people who are infected with flu. So there have been two meta-analyses of all of the pharma-sponsored clinical trial data, both published and unpublished. There was a pretty big chunk of unpublished data that these authors got access to, to um, look at whether these drugs are efficacious or not. Now, the Cochrane review, as most Cochrane reviews are, is huge. It looks at both oseltamivir and zanamivir trials. It looks at adults and children. The Lancet meta-analysis is only oseltamivir and only in adults, so it's a subset of the data that's looked at for the Cochrane review. But basically what they show is in terms of time to alleviation of symptoms, and remember these trials were done by and large in otherwise healthy non-elderly people, there definitely is a benefit to treating with oseltamivir. And both of the studies came up with a similar um, time to improvement. So less than a day, something like 17 or 18 hours faster if you're taking oseltamivir than if you were in the placebo group. And just as a con as comparison, the Cochrane Review analysis of zanamivir is sort of in the same ballpark, um, 0.6 days improvement. So, you know, it's a small improvement in time to uh, feeling better, but it is statistically significant. But that's kind of not what we want to know because we don't really usually need to treat outpatients who are otherwise healthy because they're going to get better on their own anyway. What we care about is the people who aren't getting better on their own, the people who are sick enough to end up in the hospital or people who are at risk for complications from flu. Those are the people we really want to know about. And we kind of don't know because the trials were not designed to answer this question. And when you try to make the trial data answer this question, you end up with data that's not great for that purpose. And so I will let the authors of these meta-analyses speak for themselves, but they came to very different conclusions about whether these drugs can prevent complications. In the case of the Cochrane Review, they basically said the trials weren't designed for this. There's no definition of what pneumonia is, for example, as a complication, so we can't tell you whether or not it helps. What the Lancet authors did is they sort of were lenient in terms of what the definition of pneumonia was. If the study physician filled out the adverse event form and said that the adverse event was pneumonia, and then they gave an antibiotic for it, they called that pneumonia. The Cochrane Review people said, no, that's, you know, you can't say, how was pneumonia defined? Was there an x-ray? Were there physical exam findings? Did the patient have symptoms of pneumonia? You can't really say whether or not um, that was a, a true complication. So a few years ago, there was a little bit of a debate whether neuromodase inhibitors were actually effective or not, and that was largely a result of these two meta-analyses coming to very different conclusions. And it's essentially that, you know, you're trying to in interpret trial data that wasn't designed to answer the question that you're asking. And so how you interpret them is largely based on how you view the data. So what do we do? So the CDC basically acknowledges that there are no randomized controlled trials for these drugs looking at prevention or treatment of serious flu outcomes. However, there is a large body of observational data, and these are the uh, citations for the uh, observational data that the CDC used to come to this conclusion, that show that there are benefits to using antiviral drugs beyond just treating uncomplicated flu, which is what they're indicated for. Sometimes drugs are associated with preventing severe illness and death. So CDC recommends that anyone who is sick enough to end up in the hospital or who is at high risk for complications from flu, and that's the high risk group I showed you earlier, um, should be treated for, with neuraminidase inhibitors. And this has been endorsed by the IDSA. So even though none of the neuraminidase inhibitors have treatment of hospitalized patients as an FDA indication, that's essentially what we use them for. So there is one of the studies I wanted to point out that the CDC looked at in terms of coming up with that recommendation is this PRIDE study. And this is a meta-analysis of 78 different studies that were done during the 2009 pandemic, so about 30,000 patients who ended up in the hospital with flu. 
And because it was during the 2009 pandemic, it was essentially one flu strain. It was the 2009 H1N1 pandemic strain. And the vast majority of neuraminidase inhibitors that were used in these trials were oseltamivir. And what they did is they looked at whether receipt of, an, of a, a neuraminidase inhibitor was associated with, with mortality benefit, and also looked at whether it mattered how long after the onset of symptoms that you actually started the drug. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve um, showing survival. And I'm just going to zoom in on the part that sort of matters. What you can see is people who are treated early, within two days, which is what the FDA indication is for otherwise healthy outpatients, you have a mortality of somewhere around 95%. And for each day's delay in treatment, the, the mortality curve gets worse and worse and worse. Okay? I wish they had sort of shown what the untreated group's mortality was on this curve. Um, but you can see that there's really a dose-dependent worsening of mortality the longer you delay. And so I think what we can draw from this is that there certainly is benefit in treating people earlier rather than later. However, if somebody is sick enough to be in the hospital, it's probably worth treating. Like Treating late is better than treating never. Because you never know how any one individual patient is going to respond to your treatment. So what I tell people is that ignore the 48-hour rule if you're talking about a hospitalized patient. If someone's sick enough to be in the hospital, they're sick enough to be on a neuraminidase inhibitor um, until otherwise uh, shown. So neuraminidase inhibitors are the only class of drug that we have available. Um, they are really pretty safe and well tolerated. Um, and in terms of efficacy, I think the data is a little um, undecided as to how efficacious they actually are. But because they are so otherwise safe um, and well tolerated, I think the preponderance of evidence suggests that it's probably worth treating people who are sick enough to be in the hospital or who are at risk of complications because the downside in terms of adverse effects is pretty low. Okay, so prevention. So we have a ton of flu vaccines available and I think a lot of people don't actually know how many flu vaccines there are. There have been, I think, five or six new vaccines approved in just the last 10 years. So we have the old standby. It's the one that you get from employee health every year, the standard quadrivalent inactivated influenza vaccine. And that is a combination of the four different strains of flu that may be circulating in humans at any given time. Um, and that's two influenza A viruses and two lineages of influenza B. That's why it's called quadrivalent. And there are a number of manufacturers that are approved to sell their vaccines in the United States. So in terms of the new vaccines, oh, sorry. Um, so each uh, vaccine contains 15 micrograms of the hemagglutinin from each of those vaccine strains. So four times uh, 15 is 60 micrograms of HA protein uh, in each vaccine. The new vaccine, uh, Flusilvax, is a cell culture-based vaccine. So it's essentially made similarly to the standard quadrivalent vaccine, but instead of infecting eggs with the vaccine seed strains, they use mammalian cell line that is very good at producing flu virus. So the main advantage to this vaccine is that it's never seen an egg. So for people who have an egg allergy, this is a good option. And otherwise, it's very similar to the uh, standard flu shot. It has the same amount of hemagglutinin and protein um, and is essentially made the same way aside from the substrate that the flu vaccine strains are grown in. There is an intradermal vaccine and it's sold in this um, injector device and it has this teeny tiny needle and what the injector device does is it puts the needle only into the dermis, which is where the antigen is deposited. And that's because you have so many immune cells in your skin, because your skin is exposed to all kinds of things from the outside world all the time. And you can actually get away with having less hemagglutinin in each vaccine and get an equivalent response just because your skin is so good at recognizing and responding to 
um, things that don't belong there. So it has 60% of the hemagglutinin in a standard dose vaccine. And this is sort of a good option for people who don't like needles, because this is a very small needle. It's about half the size of a normal flu vaccine needle, and it actually doesn't go very far into your skin. So there are two vaccines that are indicated particularly for elderly people. There's flu zone high dose and flu ad adjuvanted vaccine. And so the main difference is that the high dose vaccine is what it sounds like. It's basically just four times the amount of protein as in a standard flu vaccine. So it's basically kind of like giving four standard flu shots at the same time. The adjuvanted vaccine has the same amount of hemagglutinin as a standard vaccine, but it includes an adjuvant, which is an oil and water emulsion that helps to um, boost your immune response to the antigen so that you're making a better immune response. Both of these vaccines have been shown to induce better antibody responses in elderly patients, and I'll talk about their efficacy a little bit more in a minute. And then finally, there's a recombinant flu vaccine. And this is also an egg-free vaccine, but it's made in a completely different way from the other vaccines. So instead of growing uh, a flu virus, a vaccine strain in something, what this vaccine technology does is takes the gene for the hemagglutinin protein and puts it into a baculovirus, which is an insect virus. And then that virus is used to infect insect cells where it reproduces itself and makes a lot of hemagglutinin protein in the process. And so you basically just skin off, skim off all the hemagglutinin protein and then purify it and make a vaccine out of it. So not only is this an egg free, it's also flu virus free. There's no flu virus that ever comes anywhere near flu block. And because this is such a, uh, an efficient way to make vaccine protein, it actually is three times the hemagglutinin as a standard vaccine. Um, and is actually, you can make a vaccine in about two months as opposed to like six or seven months, which is how long it takes to make a standard vaccine. And I just want to mention the live attenuated vaccine. It is no longer recommended for use in the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, this is just the CDC still provides information about it. But as of now, ASIP is not recommending use of this vaccine in any population. So at this point, I mean, Really, we have a vaccine for almost every problem that you can think of. And so a lot of the reasons that people don't get vaccinated for flu, things like having an egg allergy or not liking needles or, um, you know, I got the flu from the flu shot. There's really a vaccine answer for pretty much every one of these uh, issues that somebody might come up with. And you can prescribe any of these vaccines for somebody who doesn't want what your clinic stocks. You can give them a prescription for any vaccine, find a pharmacy that dispenses it, and they can bring it back. Um, so almost there, there's almost no excuse to get, not get vaccinated at this point. And I just want to make a quick point about egg allergies. So I think a lot of people think they're allergic to eggs and probably really aren't, at least as far as flu vaccines are concerned. If you can eat a lightly cooked egg, like a runny omelet or eggs benedict on your, with your Sunday brunch, you can get a flu vaccine. I mean, there's no problem. If you can eat a slightly undercooked egg, you can get a flu vaccine. Even if you get hives when you eat a slightly undercooked egg, you can get a flu vaccine. And they used to tell you to observe these people for a half hour, just make sure they don't have anaphylaxis. Now ASAP recommends that you just administer it with usual protocol. And that's to make sure that they don't syncopize on their way out of your office. You have them sit there for 15 minutes um, so that they can not go vasal vagal from having gotten a shot. It's only when people experience you know, really severe symptoms that are consistent with anaphylaxis that you need to think about it. And even then, ASAP recommends that you can still give them a standard vaccine. You just have to give it in an environment where you can respond to anaphylaxis if it happens or you give one of the two egg-free um, vaccine preparations. So now that we know all the vaccines that are available, how effective are they? Most of the data is in with the old trivalent vaccine, with the inactivated vaccine. Um, and that's just because a lot of these other newer vaccines haven't been around that long. But this is a meta-analysis of randomized controlled, placebo-controlled trials that shows that the efficacy in non-elderly adults is about 60%. 
And it's important to note that there has never been a placebo-controlled trial in elderly adults. So we actually do not know how efficacious this vaccine would be in the elderly, because it's never been done. What we do do more often is look at effectiveness. So we look at people in the real world who get vaccinated or who don't and see what happens. So this is a meta-analysis of recent case-controlled studies with a test-negative design. So what test-negative does is it, you know, instead of looking at people who get vaccinated versus people who don't, like we know those two groups are kind of different in terms of their health-seeking behavior, things like that. So what a test-negative design does is it starts with everyone who gets a flu shot. And then they wait for you to show up in, a, in your doctor's office or in a hospital with influenza-like illness. And then you test that person. And if they test positive for flu, they become your case. If they test negative for flu, meaning they have RSV or paraflu or rhinovirus or something else entirely, then they become your control group. So there is essentially no difference in health-seeking behavior between these groups because th they all showed up at the hospital to get tested. Um, and then what they do is they compare, you know, how, how often do people come in with flu compared to something else? And so this is a kind of busy slide, so I will point out that this line here is the 50% vaccine efficacy line. For non-elderly adults, the effectiveness, or sorry, effectiveness, which is real world, is about 51%. In elderly adults, it's about 37%, and for all comers, it averages to about 40%. So as is often the case, things are less effective than they are in placebo-controlled trials. So in the real world, in the past, I think these studies go back to 2010, um, vaccine efficacy has not been that great. And these numbers actually mask a, a, a great amount of variation from year to year, and there's lots of reasons for this, but every year, vaccine efficacy is different. It goes from, you know, a low of like 10% up to maybe, if you're lucky, 60%. But it's really hard to predict any given year what your vaccine efficacy is going to be for that particular year. And so I think, you know, when I talk to people about flu vaccines, I always sort of acknowledge that flu vaccines aren't great, because I think, you know, if you tell people that, you know, you get a flu shot, you're not going to get the flu, then when they get the flu, you've made a skeptic out of them. I think what you have to say is, we know these vaccines aren't great, but they're better than nothing, and we're working on other ones. Um, and that way, people are sort of prepared for maybe the chance that they might get the flu. So, some of the newer vaccines have demonstrated enhanced clinical efficacy in the elderly. There's the high-dose vaccine, um, which in a randomized controlled trial, there was a number needed to treat of 200 to prevent one case of influenza, and that was a lab-confirmed influenza, and showed some decreases in complications like hospitalization and pneumonia and things like that. The adjuvanted vaccine um, has been in use in other parts of the world for a long time. Um, the new data that was presented to the FDA to get it approved last year, the year before, was actually a couple of well-designed case control studies that showed pretty decent um, uh, risk reductions in elderly patients. And then even flu block, which is not sort of sold as a vaccine for the elderly, actually has e efficacy in this older age group. So this is a study of adults uh, 50 years old and and higher, she has a number needed to treat of 110 to prevent one case of flu, although the majority of that benefit was seen in the 50 to 64 age group. Um, flu block may even be as effective as the high dose vaccine, although it needs to be studied a little bit more. So for both of the, the elderly vaccines, the high dose and the adjuvanted, Local injection site reactions are more common, so I think you should warn your patients about that. You know, their arm may hurt more than it usually does, and that's just because you're dumping a lot more antigen or adjuvant into your arm. The main drawback is both of these vaccines are still trivalent, and I'm not sure whether they're planning to make them quadrivalent, but as of now, both of these vaccines are missing one influenza B strain. Now, is it better to get vaccinated with the normal dose four strains, or is it better to get vaccinated with a trivalent high dose? It depends on whether the, blue, the B strain that you're missing shows up or not, and that's impossible to predict. And it's also, I can't tell you which 
vaccine is better because there have never been any head-to-head -head studies with these two vaccines. So right now, we know that they're more efficacious, but I can't tell you which one is better for your patients. And that's largely why the CDC and ACIP don't actually express a preference. They just say, get people vaccinated. Doesn't matter what you choose, just get them vaccinated. All right, quickly some future directions. So universal flu vaccines. So we all acknowledge that there are problems with flu vaccines. You have to get them every year. They change all the time. You know, it's not optimal. So the principle behind a universal flu vaccine is based on the hemagglutinin and protein, and this is the receptor binding protein. And so here's a ribbon diagram of what it looks like. It's three monomers that sort of associate into this broccoli looking thing. And analogous with broccoli, we call the top part the head and the bottom part the stock. So we know that hemagglutinin is the receptor binding protein. So it's it recognizes a receptor that allows it to infect a host cell. And that's what is shown by these little orange uh, spots here. Those are the receptor binding spots. And then I also mentioned the role that it plays in fusion when the uh, viral envelope is trying to merge with the endosomal membrane in order to get the genome out into the cytoplasm. That is largely mediated by the stalk. So these alpha helices sort of unfold like a jackknife and pull these two membranes together. So these are sort of highly functional areas of the protein. And when you look at how tolerant this protein is to mutations, what you see is low mutational tolerance. In other words, the, the protein doesn't like it when you change these amino acids, are, as you would expect, centered in the receptor binding domain. And also this stock, which has a very important functional role to play in membrane fusion. The rest of this protein is all red, meaning that it has a high tolerance for mutation. So you can change any one of these red amino acids, and the protein doesn't care much. It still can do its job. So it has a very large portion of this protein that doesn't really do anything except for attract an immune response. And we know that the head is the most immunogenic part of the, of the molecule. And you can sort of see that all of these guys sort of bundled together on the surface. What is really exposed to your B cells is the head. So you make a ton of antibodies to the head, very little to the stock. And this is the basis of antigenic drift, that you make an antibody response to a part of the molecule that has a completely OK with changing, and it'll change to escape from that antibody. So that's antigenic drift. So what we would like is sort of the opposite of what we have. What we want is a good immune response to the parts of the molecule that can't change. And that's what we don't have. So a lot of universal vaccine, flu vaccines, including work that's being done here in the microbiology department by Peter Palazzi and Adolfo Garcia Sastre, is trying to figure out how to present these uh, low tolerance areas of the, the protein to the immune system so that you create a very strong immune response to the parts of the molecule that don't work if they change. All right, so antiviral drug pipeline. So I show you this not because I think you can read this table, but to sort of show, just illustrate how many drugs are sort of in the pipeline um, coming up. And they're mainly two classes. There's small molecules, which is your typical drug. And then there's the biologics, which are mainly broadly neutralizing antibodies. And these antibodies recognize, by and large, the stock of the hemagglutinin. So they are binding to this highly conserved area that can't change. And that's how they mediate their protection and don't suffer from antigenic drift. So there's multiple mechanisms of action. They're primarily inhibitors of either hemagglutinin activity or of genome replication, so the polymerase and the nuclear protein. They're in many phases of development, from preclinical all the way through phase three. And actually, some of the drugs that are being tested for flu right now are already FDA approved for other indications. So the polymerase inhibitors are probably the farthest along. Febapiravir is actually already approved in Japan. It's in phase three in the US and EU. And then the other two drugs are also in phase three at this point. 
they work sort of at the step of genome replication. So essentially preventing the genome from being replicated so you prevent viruses from being produced at all. The hemagglutinin inhibitors include these anti-hemagglutinin stock monoclonal antibodies, but also nitazoxanide, which is um, FDA approved as a paras an anti-parasitic drug. What it does is it interferes with post-translational processing of hemagglutinin, so it gets in the way of the hemagglutinin moving to the membrane to be uh, in incorporated into progeny virions. And then the monoclonal antibodies actually have some effect, some of them have effect in fusion, but importantly, both of these drugs actually have immune modulating effects. So nitazoxanide actually induces macrophages to produce a lot of interferon, which is an antiviral molecule. The anti-hemoglobin monoclonal antibodies work as sort of antigen antibody complexes that engage with FC uh, receptors on uh, macrophages and other cells that help to sort of bring these virus particles into cells that can destroy them. All right, so in terms of the polymerase inhibitors, this is data from a, a um, conference that I went to recently. Um, this drug, SO33188, is in phase three, um, and it's being tested a lot like oseltamivir and zanamivir were. Non-elderly adults, otherwise healthy, ambulatory, showing up within two days of symptoms. And the results of this study, actually it's not published yet, but this is a picture I took with my iPhone of the screen, <laughs> um, basically is as efficacious as oseltamivir in terms of time to alleviation of symptoms. And unfortunately, they showed the placebo line on a different uh, slide, but it was sort of out here somewhere. So you get better sooner with this drug, similar to the oseltamivir trials that we already looked at. The other drug, promotivir, is actually um, Janssen is a division of Johnson & Johnson, and they're actually testing it in a completely different way. They're treating it, they're testing it in hospitalized patients, including elderly patients, and they're testing it in combination with oseltamivir because they're sort of assuming that that's how we'll use it. Because um, flu is so good at mutating to escape drug pressure, what they're doing is saying, okay, the same way that we use combination therapy for like HIV or hep C, let's use it for flu and we won't get resistance that way. And what they showed is essentially they have this hospital um, recovery scale, which ranges from being your normal self up to death. And basically when you come into the trial at, say you enter the trial and you're in the ICU, if you get the combination of Pomodivir and Oseltamivir, you're much more likely to end up in a better place, like either on a floor or back home, if you get the combination, than if you got placebo plus also Tamavir alone. So there's improvement in your clinical status um, that is signific statistically significant with the combination, but only in the group that showed up within the first 72 hours. So again, that's the problem that we're seeing is the earlier you start to be treated, the better off your outcomes are. And if you are treated later, the virus kind of isn't your problem at that point. So when people are dying of the flu, what they're really dying of is a dysregulated immune response to the flu. You know, when you're talking about people with viral pneumonia and you're like seven days out, 10 days out, the virus is usually gone at that point unless you're severely immunocompromised. And what you're suffering from is the sort of dysregulated immune response to it. And this is sort of shown by these slides here. These are um, pathology slides from two patients who died of 2009 pandemic influenza. And not to sort of look at the individual um, slides, but just to say this is a picture of diffuse alveolar damage, which is the pathological correlate of ARDS. So this is what patients die of when they die of flu. And so the question is, can we develop drugs that actually ameliorate this process or prevent it from happening in the first place? Because antivirals with something like flu are gonna have limited efficacy in preventing this kind of sequela. So we have a very bad track record with immune modulation for these sort of cytokine mediated syndromes, as most critical care people will know. Um, and I think it's just been very complicated because the way that, for instance, mouse models 
of sepsis work is very different from the way human beings with sepsis work. And I think what we were seeing is things that worked really well in mice failed in humans because we weren't testing them the right way. Um, and so just very quickly, what my work does is tries to look at using animal models to help model human flu and try to learn from them what we can glean about human flu. So this is a, an, a study of a highly pathogenic H5. This is not my work. This is other people's published work. Um, in guinea pigs and ferrets, which are a main model of uh, flu transmission. And what you can see is the pathology, the same dose, the same virus. In ferrets, it's basically just like obliterated the lung. There's no air spaces left. This is all just immune cell infiltration. Now, the guinea pig is showing signs of pneumonia, but there's still airway, there's still air there. So why is guinea pig regulating their immune response to this virus better than a ferret? Ferrets lost an average about 30% of their body weight before they died. Guinea pigs maybe got a little lethargic, but then they got better and they were fine. And the mortality is completely different. Now, both of these animals get infected with flu. They both have similar nasal wash titers and lung titers and things like that. They both get infected, they replicate flu, but for some reason, guinea pigs can get rid of it in a way that is not damaging, whereas ferrets can get rid of it, but in a highly immunopathological way. So this is work that we're doing in my lab comparing these two models. And just very quickly, we infected these animals with the same virus and took four different tissues at four different time points isolated the mRNA transcriptome from these tissues and did deep sequencing to see what happens to the immune response to these viruses. And so this is nasal terminates at 48 hours. And you have ferrets and guinea pigs. And you can look at which genes are upregulated and which genes are downregulated. And I know you can't read these genes, but it's not important because I'm going to show you you're looking at pathway analysis, trying to sort of figure out what pathways are activated in these animals and what pathways are downregulated. And so what you can see is both of them have very strong signals for inflammatory responses, which you would expect. But guinea pigs have, are starting to, to mount a sort of negative regulatory uh, pathways and sort of shutting down the the immune response in a way that ferrets don't seem to be doing. And this project is sort of in progress, and I can't tell you what the ultimate result is, but hopefully we'll discover ways of immune regulation in flu that are ultimately more beneficial than some humans can currently mount. And so I will take any questions. residual uh, uh, long-term effect of the vaccine from year to year? Um, residual in terms of? The beneficial effect. Ah, so we know that there's beneficial effects of repeated infection. Vaccination is a little more complicated. Um, there are some studies that suggest actually being repeatedly vaccinated may not be a good idea um, because the inactivated vaccine does not produce as robust of an immune response as an infection does, that you're kind of getting this sort of bad little response every year and it doesn't really build up in a way that repeated infections do. Um, I think that's sort of not fully accepted, um, but I think definitely there are, are things that we can do that make a longer lasting and more beneficial response than what we currently have. So Nicole, you know, clearly the aim of the vaccine is for an individual to help an individual mount a response and cure the virus. But if the down if, if one of the major complications is actually a dysregulated immune response and a, and a hyper immune response, if you give the vaccine, is there actually a potential that you worsen that because you've primed the individual? Yeah, so I don't think there's any evidence for that. And we actually do have evidence that getting vaccinated, you are less likely to have complications than if you don't. So I think the immune dys dysregulation certainly doesn't happen in everyone, 
We don't understand why it happens in the people that it happens in. But there doesn't seem to be sort of um, an antibody-mediated worsening okay. um, the way there is for something like dengue, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. That has not really been shown for flu. Uh, I'm actually going to hold here for questions because we're a little bit, little bit over time. But thank you very much for an outstanding talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.